This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak buttons now. And just before I call Mr Stewart, can I say that we have signers here so you could speak clearly and more slowly um, in, in, in your contribution, that would be very helpful. I know Mr Stewart will set the bar high. I call Alexander Stewart to open the debate. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am delighted and grateful of the privilege of being able to open this member's debate on World Hearing Day and Hearing Loss Awareness Week. And I'd like to extend a welcome to guests who are joining us this afternoon in the gallery. For me, this member's business motion and subsequent debate are something of a double-edged sword, as they create awareness of two separate events, but with one single thread, hearing awareness. Firstly, World Hearing Day takes place on the 3rd of March each year in order to raise awareness of how to prevent deafness and hearing loss, as well as the promotion of ear and hearing across the world. Indeed, this year, the World Health Organization plans to draw attention to the importance of early identification and intervention for hearing loss. Many people live with unidentified hearing loss, often failing to realize that they are missing out on certain sounds and certain words. Merely checking one's hearing regularly would be the first step to addressing some of these issues. Secondly, Hearing Awareness Week, which runs from the 3rd to the 9th of March, has been fully adopted here in Scotland. It provides an opportunity to reflect on our collective actions, practices and environment which support good hearing uh, experiences. Poor acoustics can often be a significant cause of discomfort, distress and exclusion. And individuals with conditions like tinnitus and sensitive hearing are at a real disadvantage when it comes to employment and enjoying a normal lifestyle. Therefore, it is only right that we work to create much more awareness of how well and at what degree that someone can actually hear. With some 11 million people in the United Kingdom with hearing loss, for them attending meetings, events, trips to the cinema and concerts can be a terribly stressful and frustrating experience. Common issues of poor acoustics, for example, or maybe a presenter whose script is hard to understand, plus even background noise, can all act as barriers to participation. Also, other people's reaction to someone with hearing loss can be a source of stress, as many people react inappropriately uh, to those who are unable to hear, uh, and they are impatient with them. Deputy Presiding Officer, I recently uh, received an invitation from a highly innovative company called Ideas for Ears, which is based in my region in Dunblane. Headed up by Director Sally Shaw, who is in the gallery today, the company launched the UK's first hearing access protocol last year at Go Live at the Green in Glasgow. And as an MSP, I was delighted to attend that event, and I found it extremely motivating and interesting. The initiatives that they have identified have a number of protocols. Meetings and events should be accessible for everybody, no matter what their hearing is. With some basic principles, hearing access is influenced by the venue. The facilities or the equipment made available and the way that a meeting is run and structured. Poor hearing access can be difficult or impossible for the individual to overcome through their own actions and deeds alone. Therefore, this hearing access protocol is designed to enable organisers of work-related meetings and events to arrange their own organisational policies and procedures around access and inclusion in a way that recognises our language and communication as a fundamental human right. It sets out objectives in a clear, practical way, covering everything from speaking clearly and facing the audience to interpreting loops and having support from BSL sign language interpreters. This is especially important at public consultation and community engagement events. These have been welcomed by Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland, Disability Equality Scotland, as well as Deaf Scotland. They recognise the importance of the protocol, not only as an essential framework, but also as a way in which we may contribute, collaborate, uh, and ensure that we can communicate to our full potential. Deputy Presiding Officer, I echo Ideas for Ears' hopes that this, will, this protocol will be adopted right across Scotland and the United Kingdom. 
as a good and proper practice for all meetings and events which will bring about substantial change for these millions of individuals who have hearing loss. There is a massive variation in the way people are able to hear and this very much needs to be recognised and responded to. I commend and congratulate all who are playing their part to assist and support individuals and groups as they move forward with hearing loss. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the cross-party group in this parliament for the work that they have undertaken and wish them continued success with their endeavours to assist people who, who suffer from deafness and hearing loss. If you are hard of hearing or deaf, then we all have a duty to ensure that we can do all we can to ensure that the opportunities are there to participate. I look forward to hearing, seeing and hearing these protocols being developed uh, and I would be delighted, and I am delighted, that I've had the opportunity this afternoon uh, to throw my weight behind many of these fantastic initiatives. People in Scotland only have to attend a GP or private hearing advisor uh, to find out what their hearing situation is like and have it checked. We already know that hearing loss in the working age individuals can contribute to the feelings of isolation alongside communication difficulties, which in turn mean that employees do not fulfil their full potential. Employers are urged to introduce employees to practices and procedures which will ensure that individuals with hearing loss are supported. And all staff, especially if they work with colleagues who have already suffered uh, a loss of hearing or deafness, are encouraged to attend uh, the awareness training courses that are put on. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I look forward to hearing from the Minister uh, what the Scottish Government will do to play their part in this process and what initiatives they will bring forward. Because government have a duty to provide support, funding and drive the need for change in cooperation with many of the leading charities and groups who play such a vital role in assisting individuals who have hearing loss or deafness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I call Mark Griffin to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Mr Griffin, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, at the outset, I'd just like to apologise to you, Presiding Officer, and to the Chamber that I may not be able to stay for the duration of the debate, um, as the Scottish Government will be given early sight of statements they plan to discuss later on um, this afternoon that I will be involved in. Um, so apologies for that. Um, but I'd like to thank Alexander Stewart for bringing his debate today and ensuring World Hearing Day and Hearing Awareness Week 2019 are celebrated in this Parliament. As convener of the Cross-Party Group on Deafness, I'm hugely grateful to Ideas for Ears and Deaf Scotland for working with Mr Stewart today so that we can debate the issue of hearing access um, to public and community spaces. And indeed, the Cross-Party Group on Deafness is always looking for new members, and I would encourage anyone here today to come along to our uh, next meeting. And hearing access is something there's a, a particularly acute need to support the one million plus community who are either deaf and hard of hearing, um, but it can and, and does affect all people in Scotland. As the motion details, noise and poor acoustics can cause significant discomfort and exclusion from um, group activities for older age groups as well as people with conditions such as dementia and autism. Now, some members in the chamber may be aware that I now use a hearing aid and prior to having that hearing aid um, fitted um, I experienced uh, the frustration of um, being unable to hear discussions um, clearly sometimes in the chamber when there was interventions from sedentary positions sometimes that meant missing out on key debating points but I might be able to, to manage those situations, be more able to speak up when I experience that sort of situations. But for other groups, deaf, um, deaf people, older people, those with dementia and autism, they may be less able, feel less comfortable to speak up and manage that situation. We're all undoubtedly diminished for losing out in their participation. I think it's therefore vitally important that we do consider how hearing access is prioritised to ensure greater public involvement and participation in the many varied events that we have. And as Deaf Scotland point out, communication is a two-way process. So if your ability to communicate is affected, the contribution 
that you are then able to make to society and your culture is entirely impeded. As a result, being unable to communicate really puts a person's mental and physical health at risk because of that isolation. And on the cross-party group and at the heart of the debate during the, the passage of the BSL bill, we talked about how being unable to communicate puts barriers in the ways of accessing services, um, educational attainment, um, and even accessing health services. And as I said, then BSL users and deaf people can quite often be marginalised and um, misunderstood. And in recent weeks, we have debated how social isolation is increasingly a social and public health epidemic. And one area I think all parties are agreed that action is, is needed. And in my contribution to that debate, I spoke about how yet more cuts to local services and local government will only dismantle and undermine some of the services that keeps communities together. And when you take into account those cuts and think about um, hearing access um, adds to that, you can really begin to get a picture of how that isolation um, is created. But I know firsthand how much we need to improve the infrastructure and make it more inclusive. And though we are today talking about managing noise to aid hearing, during the BSL bill I spoke about how few BSL interpreters there are in Scotland at that time, only 80. And last summer I organised a, a series of meetings and it was um, highlighted again just how difficult it was to source interpreters, um, secure the funding um, along with the, the, the other associated costs. That's why the proposal in this motion uh, to look at the employability opportunities to roll out noise absorption panels and enhancement devices to help tackle noise and acoustic issues should be particularly thought-provoking for, for government. But once again, President Officer, I'd like to thank Ideas for Years, Deaf Scotland and Mr Stewart for bringing this debate to the Chamber. I hope we can go away ahead of World Hearing Day and Hearing Access Week 2019, thinking about how we can make public spaces more inclusive, free of noise and to encourage healthy communication. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Annabel Ewing to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Mr Balfour will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Ewing. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too am pleased to have been called to speak today to mark World Hearing Day and Hearing Awareness Week. And I would also congratulate Alexandra Stewart on securing this important members debate. Uh, I do recall when I spoke in a debate some years ago on a uh, similar marking of a similar occasion, my colleague Dennis Robertson, who used to sit just there, within one sentence of my starting to speak, had already intervened to tell me to speak more slowly. So I hope I'm achieving that today. If Dennis is listening, I, I do listen to what other people say. As we have heard, presiding officer, the focus of Hearing Awareness Week this year is very much on the importance of early identification and intervention for hearing loss, with the strapline being check your hearing. Uh, and at the outside of my remarks, I would wish to formally recognise the excellent work that is done on behalf of deaf people by a range of national and local organisations and individuals right across Scotland. They all work unstintingly to improve the lives of those who are deaf or otherwise suffer hearing loss and to challenge the removal of those barriers that still remain to this day for the over one million individuals who are deaf or suffer hearing loss. In Scotland, it is recognised, I believe, uh, presiding officer, that we have made significant improvements in, the, in a number of areas, such as the development of quality standards for NHS audiology services, with regular meetings of NHS audio, audiology heads of service to coordinate and share best practice. Such a meeting, I understand, taking place today at uh, PRI in Perth. We have also seen an increase in the provision of lip reading classes and the launch of a national joint sensory strategy. And we have also seen, as, as Mark Griffith referred to, this Parliament passed uh, his historic British Sign Language Bill in 2015, with the Scottish Government launching its first groundbreaking national plan for BSL in October 2017. Just to remind those who may not know, this plan is to run till 2023 and sets forth 70 discrete action points that the Government is to take 
in the first three years to 2020 of the, the plan with a progress report to be published at that time. It was shaped by the input of over a thousand individuals and dozens of organisations and covers many aspects, including, of course, the important early years and education. So this Parliament will wish to ensure, sure, no doubt, presiding officer, that the progress report expected next year is subject to full scrutiny to ensure that the action points promised are being delivered on the ground. For it is indeed necessary to ensure as far as the BSL National Plan and other service issues are concerned, that improved services are available to people in their local communities. That is what will make the key difference in ensuring that those who are deaf or who have suffered hearing loss can access their rights as full and equal citizens. In this regard, uh, uh, Action on Hearing Loss Scotland did a power of work with their comprehensive report of a few years ago entitled hearing matters and a number of important issues were raised at that time uh, and I, I know and suspect that some of these issues will still be present to this day in terms of the challenges that are still to be overcome and it would be helpful therefore when closing if the minister and I do recognize that a number of these issues are, are issues that are dealt with across uh, government portfolio but if the minister could clarify and if she can't clarify if she will undertake to refer the comments to the relevant minister in charge but clarify the position as to how matters stand with respect to, for example, hearing loss uh, research. Uh, the ask was that that was to be a strategic, strategic priority. Um, how the number, as Mark Griffin said, of BSL interpreters meets demand uh, at the present time. How the participation of deaf young people has fared in programmes programs like the hugely successful Modern Apprenticeship Programme run by Skills Development Scotland and what progress has been made to ensure that all transport is fully accessible, including, of course, the important provision of information. At the same time, perhaps the Minister can clarify what the Scottish Government's response has been to the call from action on Hearing Loss Scotland, Age Scotland and Scottish War Blinded for timely screening of veterans further to the excellent joint initiative that they have been working on to compile the Combating Sight and Hearing Loss Guide booklet, which in fact, presiding officer, was launched last month. In conclusion, I would like to stress that it is these practical issues that will, if resolved, make a key difference to the lives of deaf people and people who suffer hearing loss. And we, as parliamentarians, have a duty not to take our eye off the ball, but rather to persist with our questions and our ambitions to change lives for the better. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Ms Ewing. And I call Jeremy Balfour. Mr Balfour, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I add my thanks to Alexander Stewart for securing this important debate on World Hearing Day and Hearing Awareness Week 2019. In Scotland, there are over one million people with some degree of loss, of whom approximately 546,000 are over the age of 60. In the 2011 census, over 350,000 of the Scottish population, aged three or over, listed deafness or partial hearing loss as a long-term health condition. These numbers are challenging, and I welcome any progress groups, companies, charities can make to raise awareness on how to prevent deafness and hearing loss. I'm sure we all know someone affected by hearing loss and how it impacts on his or her quality of life. My mother has a hearing loss, and I'm aware sometimes at family gatherings that she's missing out on conversation and information because she finds it difficult to hear, and that as a result, it can affect her enjoyment at an event and stop her paying the bill. Activities a hearing person takes for granted can present challenges for a person with hearing loss. Take, for example, a conversation with a driver when you're a passenger in a taxi. I recently contacted local authorities across Scotland and discovered that out of the 30 who have responded to my request for information, only one local authority requires taxis to have a hearing loop in their vehicles, while no local authority requires private hires to include hearing loops. Hardly an example of inclusive communication. Deafblind Scotland want communication to be 
to acknowledge as a human right and believe that systematic failure such as the one I have just cited remains a significant problem in Scotland and leads to everyday breaches of human rights for the deaf community. Ideas for Ears is a community-led social enterprise that provides consultancy support to help business and organisations more successfully meet the needs of customers, staff and other stakeholders who are having hearing loss. We advocate for hearing loss which is about the application of practices that make hearing and following conversation and audible information more possible for more people. Hearing access needs to be a priority and I support the ideas of EO's view that among people in Scotland who have hearing loss, the majority have the ca capability to hear and follow what is being said well or adequately as long as the environment is right. Sadly, by and large, the environment in many workplaces, including this one, is still not right for people with hearing loss. Research by ideas for ears amongst employees identified that 74% of respondents with hearing loss sometimes regularly or always experience difficulties hearing at work meetings. For many who acquire disability during their work in life, the development of an, imp an impairment will bring about a crisis point in the workplace, bringing their future into doubt. According to Deaf Action, one in four people have left their job due to discrimination. The number of people with hearing loss is at an all-time high and is increasing as the, as the population continues to age. With 40% of working age population predicted to have a long-term health condition by 2030, this is a crucial moment to address what good work means for a large section of a population. In a recent report published by Leonard Chesler about inclusive employment, we identify the need to adapt workplaces to build a more resilient workforce. To enable disabled people to participate in the labour market, they place emphasis on the need to ensure disabled people have access to reasonable adjustments and assistive technology that support them carry out their job. For a person with hearing loss, this could be an electronic note taker service or a hearing enhancement device that can potentially be funded through the UK government's access to work scheme that provides financial support to ensure somebody's disability or health condition doesn't hold them back at work. We need to challenge entranced attitudes in the workplace. Leonard Chester's report identified that 24% of employers say they would be less likely to employ someone with a disability who employs citing the cost of workplace adjustments and concern as a disabled person who struggles to do the job as reasons not to employ them. We need to create the right environment for deaf people who can make a, a positive contribution. I therefore welcome initiatives such as Hearing Awareness Week that raises awareness of hearing loss, encourages us all to think about good hearing health and to work collectively to ensure we create more inclusive society for people living with hearing loss. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now call on Claire Hockey to close for the Government Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I wish to thank Alexander Stewart for uh, bringing this important motion to the Chamber today. And as we've heard uh, here today across the Chamber, there is support to improve the care and opportunities for people with hearing loss. This year, World Hearing Day focuses on the importance of early identification and intervention for hearing loss, as many people live with an unidentified or hidden hearing loss. I also want to ensure that adults and children with a sensory impairment have the same access to services and opportunities as everyone else. This is why our See Here strategy focuses on children and adults and covers deafness, sight loss and dual sensory loss. Partnerships and communication are crucial to the effectiveness of See Here. This strategic framework recommends that local partnerships between statutory and third sector bodies should consider options for introducing basic sensory checks at agreed times in care pathways. 
and I'm delighted that these have been introduced in care homes in some local areas and I hope it continues to expand. We have also been working with partners to explore the delivery of enhanced community audiology services in a GP practice setting. Initial pilots in NHS Ayrshire Narn and NHS Tayside, and, and these link with third sector providers, commence, and these commence this month and they will run over the next 12 months. See here also enables training and development. For example, more than 200 people have accessed the Sensory Champions Training Programme, a bespoke training course created in partnership with RNIB and Action on Hearing Loss, providing core training and skills across key aspects of sensory loss and rehabilitation. Additionally, three e-learning modules focusing on the awareness of communication strategies will be available on the NHS training website TURAS and that will be available for all. And I'm grateful that the See Here National Coordinator worked closely with partners to support and promote the Ideas for Ears Hearing Access Protocol for ensuring accessible meeting spaces throughout the country. I know the difficulties faced by people living with sensory impairment. I recently met with staff from Deaf Scotland to discuss the issues facing people with hearing loss and I fully appreciate that each person will have their own individual unique communication preference. This links directly to individual communication strategies and language acquisition. If hearing loss is congenital then the person will almost certainly have learned British Sign Language as a first language and English being a very separate and second language. And I'm proud that this government funds Contact Scotland BSL, the UK's first publicly funded online BSL video relay service that enables deaf and deaf blind BSL users to contact and interact with Scottish public sector bodies and third sector services. This allows users to self-manage their own calls, live as independently as possible and to retain a level of privacy no longer having to rely on family and friends to make calls for them. The World Health Organisation confirms as people live longer, the prevalence of disability will increase. So it follows that in Scotland, the risk of people with or who develop a hearing loss will increase. They may also have other primary conditions such as dementia, autism or learning disabilities. And their hearing loss may be a hidden condition which exasperates their primary condition. I know that people with sensory impairment who develop dementia face additional challenges, including an increased uh, sense of disorientation and risk of social isolation. The onset of dementia may be more difficult to detect by family and carers. And equally, it may be difficult for the person with sensory impairment to communicate what is actually going on. In 2017, we published our third three-year national dementia strategy. And this includes continuing our national focus on dementia health, social services and housing and the workforce development by Im implementing the National Dementia Skills and Competencies Framework, promoting excellence and the National Allied Health Professionals Dementia Framework. NHS, Scotland's, NHS Health Scotland's report into dementia and equalities uh, into equalities issues, identified dementia and sensory impairment as a key area where improvements are required. And we are undertaking national work through the two dementia workforce programmes to improve service in these areas. Integrated dementia support packages will include uh, attention to recognising or identifying sensory issues. For example, everyone in Scotland newly diagnosed with dementia is entitled to be offered a minimum of a year's worth of dedicated post-diagnostic support. A named and trained key worker will coordinate the individual's dementia care with other elements of their care and support, including those elements addressing sensory impairment. People with primary uh, condition, uh, people whose primary condition is autism can have a range of sensory issues over and above, um, including um, Oh, sorry, pardon me, sensory issues, including over and under sensitivity to noise, light and smell. And this was highlighted to me during my recent visit to Reach Lanarkshire Autism in my own constituency of Rutherglen. Our priorities for the next three years are to ensure that we provide high quality training to all health 
as social care and education staff in order to uh, better understand the impact of being autistic. And this should cover what measures need to be taken in various environments to reduce the impact of sensory sensitivity and to ensure that people with autism and learning disabilities have choice and control over the services they receive and are supported to be independent and active citizens. In December, we launched a Fairer Scotland for Disabled People and Employment Action Plan. And this sets out our commitment to at least half Scotland's disability employment gap by 2038 and an initial range of actions to support this. Implementation of this plan is now underway across government and our partnership with the sector will continue as we drive the plan forward. It contains five longer term actions and 93 actions to make meaningful progress towards these ambitions. Support services that meet disabled people's needs, decent incomes and fairer working lives, places that are accessible to everyone, protected rights and active participation. Um, just before I close, um, President Officer, I'd like to thank all of the really valuable contributions we've had from across the Chamber, from Jeremy Balfour, from Mark Griffin um, and from Annabel Ewing and I undertake to come back to her with um, answers to some of the questions that she asked and some, some of the, the challenges to the Scottish Government. Um, and, and with regards to veterans though, I can um, reassure her that Veterans, including those who have served as reservists, receive uh, priority access to NHS primary, secondary and tertiary care for any condition um, relating to their service. And that's based on clinical need. Um, and that includes audiology and hearing aids. So I hope that gives her a level of reassurance. Presiding officer, everyone should feel valued and included and accepted by society. And it's only then that we can all live in a fairer Scotland, a more equal Scotland and a Scotland for everyone. Thank you very much. That concludes this debate and I suspend this meeting of Parliament until two o'clock.